Number one, Yahweh, the supreme creator. The Bible, as you know, probably, was not written in American English. The Bible, at least the part that I'm going to start with, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, was written in ancient Hebrew. And Hebrew, I show it to you here because it is so weird. And I think that's important for you to remember, that the Bible is weird. It's not a 21st century document. It's not written in the Western Hemisphere. They didn't have smartphones and cars and everything else that we have today. So if we're going to understand the Bible properly, we need to adjust our thinking to what the Bible says in the world of the Bible rather than just assuming our way of thinking onto the Bible itself. So in the beginning, we read in Genesis 1.1, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim va'et ha'aretz. That's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the first verse of the Bible. Now, right from the very first sentence of the entire Bible, we start with the assumptions. Many of us do, at least. We see this word Elohim, the word translated God, and we say, ah, that is a plural. That's a plural form. And then we see the word created, the word bara in Hebrew, and we say that's a singular form. There it is. Plurality and unity. Obviously, Genesis 1-1 is teaching the Trinity. And I can see where that, I don't think that's dumb. I, th I, I can see where that's coming from. I, I see the logic of that. But I question the force of the argument. Um, I ask the question, well, what if we're wrong about that? What if the Trinity is not really what's in view from the first verse of the Bible? What if, in fact, we're reading that in rather than reading it out? And so... When I was thinking about Genesis, Genesis, of course, is written hundreds of years before Christ. Nobody knows really for sure when Genesis was, was written. But if Moses wrote Genesis, then somewhere between 1200 and 1400 B.C. would be a good guess. So let's, let's just go with 1400 B.C. And the, the Trinity was not fully articulated until the 4th century. So we're looking at a 1700-year difference between the book of Genesis and a full-orbed articulation of the Trinity. Uh, that would be like you reading your ideas into something from the 300s. I mean, maybe if you're talking about eating meat, they ate meat three, you know, 1,700 years ago, but um, it's easy to presuppose and make anachronisms. And these are two deadly enemies for us, presuppositions and anachronisms. This is just for Bible study in general, and I assure you this is, this is across the board. This is not my opinion. This is, this is what good Bible study uh, and hermeneutics, as, as the field is called, would all say. Presupposition is something supposed beforehand, something you presuppose. It's an assumption you bring to the text. Anachronism is an error in chronology, reading modern ways of thinking into ancient documents. So these are two things we want to avoid as we read the scriptures, just on any topic, on any topic, but especially when it comes to God's identity. We don't want to read later ideas into earlier documents um, or presuppose something beforehand. We want, to, we want to read it over against its own context. So the question is, what is the context of Genesis? Well, Genesis chapter 1, as, as we're looking at here, we just looked at 1 verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 is, an, is a creation account. And as it turns out, people in that part of the world at that time, what they call the ancient Near East, had other creation accounts as well. And Genesis is going to be read against those creation accounts, not against later theology. So, let's, But let's start with the word Elohim. Let's start with the word Elohim. Is it, does it mean God or does it mean gods? Yes. It is a plural form, and it can be translated God, and other times it can be translated gods. Both are correct. It is singular or plural depending on the verb. In Hebrew, 
the noun has a number and the verb has a number. And so if you have a noun where you're not sure, do I translate it plural or singular? You look at the verb and the verb tells you how to deal with the noun in that case. Pagan gods are also Elohim. So for example, Judges 16.23, Dagon, their god. 1 Kings 11.33, Chemosh, the god or Elohim of Moab, and Milcom, the god or Elohim of the Ammonites. Judges 8.33, the people made Baal Berit, their god, their Elohim. So if we're going to say that the god of Israel has a mysterious plurality within his nature, then we also have to say that of Dagon and Chemosh and Milcom and Baal Berit, and all the other gods of all the other nations, because they all receive the word Elohim to describe them just like the, the God of Israel. And so because of this, generally scholars today no longer make the case that Elohim is some, somehow a hint of the Trinity. Here are three examples. This is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which reads, The use of the plural form with singular meaning is not unique to Israel. Again, this is, this is genuinely weird. I'm not trying to dismiss this at all. Elohim is a plural form, but it has a singular meaning when it refers to the God of Israel. Similar forms occur in pre-Israelite Babylon, Babylonian and Canaanite texts in which a worshiper wishes to exalt a particular God above others. This form has been called the plural of majesty or the intensive plural because it implies that all the fullness of deity is concentrated in the one God. You get it? So they're using a plural form not to indicate that there are multiple gods, but to indicate the fullness of the one God that they're referring to. The New Bible Dictionary says, though a plural form, Elohim, can be treated as a singular, in which case it means the one supreme deity. And in English versions is rendered God. Like its English equivalent, it is grammatically considered a common noun and conveys the notion of all that belongs to the concept of deity in contrast with man. The Wycliffe Dictionary of Theology says, Some Christians have explained the plural as an anticipation of the Trinity. But again, without a commonly used singular, no one in Old Testament times could have developed Trinitarian ideas from the word alone. That's a very strong statement written by a dictionary that is exclusively included Trinitarian scholars in its making. No one in Old Testament times could have developed Trinitarian ideas from the word Elohim alone. The plural form is better understood as indicating, and this is the same kind of idea we've already seen, plenitude of power. Now, everyone in the ancient Near East had God, had a God or gods, multiple gods, and they had their own creation accounts from their part of the world at that time period. But the most famous of them is the Enuma Elish, which was found on seven tablets, and that was discovered in 1849 at the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, which is today Mosul, Iraq. And so this is a early creation story. It's dated to the 7th century before Christ, but it's very likely a copy from the first Babylonian dynasty, which dates to 1900 to 1600 BC. So even older than the book of Genesis was written, this was already around in that part of the world at that time. Um, and each of the tablets has about 100 to 170 lines of cuneiform script written in the Akkadian language. Anyone speak Akkadian here today? I, I don't either. I don't either. So we have to trust the scholar's translation on this one. But I wanted to read the Enuma Elish to you, at least a few selections from it, to show you the way a creation story normally read, a creation account normally read in that part of the world at that time. And that will serve as a backdrop for us against which we can read Genesis 1, and I think it will pop for you in an exciting way. So tablet one reads, When the heavens above did not exist and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demi-urge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. 
Demiurge is a crafts, uh, well, Timot's female, so I don't want to say craftsman, craftswoman in this case, um, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together before Meadowland had coalesced and reed bed was to be found when not one of the gods had been formed or had come into being when no destinies had been decreed. The gods were created within them. Lamu and Lahamu were formed and came into being. So these are like created gods. This is before the creation of the universe. Lamu and Lahamu. And they're, they're very loud, annoying baby gods. Just like baby humans are loud and annoying. <laughs> and they cry and they keep you from sleeping. You'll see what I mean in a second. Verse 22 from Tablet 1. Their clamor got loud, throwing Tiamat into a turmoil. They jarred the nerves of Tiamat, that's the mother, and by their dancing they spread alarm in Anduruna. Apsu did not diminish their clamor, that's the daddy, and Tiamat was silent when confronted with them. Their conduct was displeasing to her, yet though their behavior was not good, she wished to spare them. Apsu opened his mouth and addressed Tiamat, Their behavior has become displeasing to me, and I cannot rest in the daytime or sleep at night. I will destroy and break up their way of life, that silence may reign and we may sleep. That's like any dad ever, right? Uh, geez, these kids are just too loud, can't sleep at night. Um, except he's a little radical here. Verse 39, I will destroy and break up their way of life, right? Uh, 41, when Tiamat heard this, she raged and cried out to her spouse, How can we destroy what we have given birth to? Mumu spoke up with counsel for Apsu, destroy my father that lawless way of life that you may rest in the daytime and sleep by night. Apsu was pleased with them. His face beamed. The gods heard it and were frantic, skipping ahead a little bit. Ea, who knows everything, perceived their tricks. He, Ea, put Apsu to slumber as he poured out sleep. He bound Apsu and killed him. So that's uh, the first murder of you know, the gods. On behalf of Tiamat, Ea had murdered her husband, Apsu. Skipping way ahead to Tablet 4. I mean, there's, there's a lot more. I, I, it's like a soap opera. You know, I, I'm leaving out so many parts, but, you know, what are you going to do? Tablet 4, the, uh, line 28. They rejoiced and offered congratulations. Marduk is the king. So this is the introduction of Marduk. Uh, they added to him a mace, a throne, and a rod. They gave him an irresistible weapon that overwhelms the foe. They said, go cut Tiamat's throat. So things have really turned against Tiamat at this point. Tiamat and Marduk, the sage of the gods, came together, joining in strife, drawing near to battle. Bel, also known as Marduk, spread out his tent and enmeshed her. He let loose the evil wind, the rear guard, in her face. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. She let the evil wind in so that she could not close her lips. The fierce winds weighed down her belly. Her inwards were distended, and she opened her mouth wide. He let fly an arrow and pierced her belly. He tore open her entrails and slit her inwards. Innards, I would say. He bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. Now, just keep in mind, this is an account of creation, and the universe has yet to be created. This is just turmoil prior to the heavens and the earth coming into being. It's the pre-story. Then skipping ahead to line 129, Bell placed his feet on the lower parts of Tiamat and with his merciless club smashed her skull. He severed her arteries. Bell rested, surveying the corpse in order to divide the lump by a clever scheme. He split her into two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens. Finally, the first act of creation is to take half of the dead god Tiamat, whose skull is smashed and artery slit, and to lift her up. And that's, that's where we get the sky from, everyone. Now you know. He stretched his skin and appointed a watch. Uh, tablet 5, he placed the heights of heaven in her Tiamat's belly. From her two eyes, he let the Euphrates and Tigris flow. He heaped up the distant mountains on her breasts. He bored wells to channel the springs. Thus half of her he stretched out and made it firm as the earth. Tablet 6, skipping ahead again. I will bring together blood to form bone. I will bring it to being Lulu, whose name shall be man. I will create Lulu, man, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid that they may rest. Marduk assembled the great gods. Who was the one who instigated warfare? Who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion? Kingu. 
is the one who instigated warfare. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. All right, clear? That's select readings from the Enuma Elish, a book from a little before the time when Genesis was written down and discussing the same topic. All right, now let's say that that's the world you come from. and No doubt there are Egyptian versions of this too that have the Egyptian gods instead of these uh, Babylonian gods, right? Let's say that's the world that you come from and you read this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. What would pop for you? Would it be that the fact that the word Elohim is plural? No, because all the gods use the word Elohim as plural. What would pop for you? There's no struggle. Where's the fight? Where are the other gods? Where's the corpse split into pieces? You know, where's the drama? Where's the backstory? There's none of it. It just, in the beginning, God created, and then he starts speaking. He says, let there be light, and let the waters be separated from the waters, and let the dry land appear, and, you know, you have the greater light and the lesser light, and it's just this elegant, struggle-free account of this incredibly powerful God that just does it by himself. You'd just be like, who is this God? Who could do that? He has no competition and his power is supreme. But it gets better. This is all of Genesis 1 on one slide. Don't worry if you can't read it. I want to show you some patterns. We read over and over, there are six days of creation, and God said, 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 and God said. And then at the end of each section, we have there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. And then you have the same thing for the third day and the fourth day and the sixth day. Over and over and over again. These patterns are really interesting, right? Every day, God says, God saw that it was good. 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 And then in the last day, God saw that it was very good. On the first day, God creates the heavens. On the fourth day, God populates the heavens. On the second day, God creates the waters. On the fifth day, God populates the waters. On the third day, God makes the dry land appear. On the sixth day, God populates the land. What's the point? What's the point? The point is that creation is ordered by God. It's not chaotic. It's not the result of a, of a war or of haphazard collisions of events. It is meticulously planned and carried out in an orderly manner as God's... And God doesn't even need a club to smash Tiamat in the head and crush her skull. He just speaks and stuff happens. All of this would have just popped for ancient people reading this because they would have had their background information and they'd be reading this against it and they'd just be like, who is... This God. I mean, if this is even partially true, this God is way more powerful than anything we've ever heard of. This is just incredible. Um, and so that's, that's the title of our class. One God overall. One God overall. Who is this one God over everything else? His power, his lack of competition, his supremacy. And that, I believe, is the point of Genesis 1. It's not the only point, but it's one of the points of Genesis 1, is that there is this one God who is over all. When we get to Genesis 2, we see something else that's really interesting. Verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became 
a living creature. We have three usages in this section of the word Lord, where we have all capital letters. Now that refers to, in the original Hebrew, God's name, which is commonly pronounced Yahweh. The first evidence we have on the planet for the name of God, Yahweh, is dated to the year 840 BC. Our manuscripts come from later because paper doesn't last so long. But this is a stone evidence of God's name. It's the Mesha Stele. It's a Canaanite inscription named for King Mesha of Moab, written in a Phoenician alphabet, very similar to Paleo-Hebrew script, and it contains the first known usage of Yahweh. And uh, cuneiform is not, it's not easy to read. Neither is ancient Hebrew or ancient Phoenician script. It's, it's also very difficult to read. Um, but we do have in here the name of God. It's really something. There it is, the name of God. And uh, so if we want to think about the name of God, really the place in the Bible to go to is Exodus 3.15. It's where God talks to Moses at the burning bush. You're familiar with this probably. God further said to Moses, and this is from the New Jerusalem Bible, you are to tell the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name for all time, and thus I am to be invoked for all generations to come. So this is the word Yahweh. Now there is some debate about how to pronounce God's name, as we'll cover in just a second. But I, I quoted the New Jerusalem Bible because it does just include the name Yahweh rather than translating it into the Lord. Uh, generally, I'm quoting from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Uh, but in this case, I quoted the New Jerusalem Bible. Uh, I thought this was pretty helpful. This is a little comment from the Apollos Commentary of the Old Testament, which writes, The name YHWH comes 6,828 times in the Old Testament, with the shortened form Yah occurring 49 times. Sometimes referred to as the Tetragrammaton, it consists of the four Hebrew consonants YHVH or YHWH. In most modern English versions, I'm just going to say Yahweh instead of YHWH, Yahweh is rendered as Lord. This translation derives from the fact that possibly as early as about 300 B.C., it became customary among Jews when reading the biblical text to substitute Adonai, the Hebrew word for Lord, in place of Yahweh out of reverence for the divine name. This practice is reflected in the earliest Greek translation of the Hebrew, the Septuagint, or LXX, which frequently uses Kyrios, Lord, to render the Tetragrammaton. The original pronunciation of YHVH or YHWH taken to be Yahweh is a tentative reconstruction based on several lines of evidence. A misunderstanding of how the vowels of Adonai were added to the consonants YHVH led to the creation of the hybrid form Jehovah in the 16th century. Unfortunately, the English rendering capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D suggests that Yahweh is a title rather than a personal name. So that gives us a little bit of background there. I, I realize that this commentary writes in kind of a technical, snooty way. So let, let's just review that. First of all, YHWH is pronounced Yahweh. That is the name of God. Hello. That's a big deal. God has a name. His name is Yahweh. Scholars are not entirely sure that Yahweh is the correct pronunciation. It could be Yehovah. It could be with a W sound. I've heard three or four different ways to say it. I'm just going to say Yahweh because that's the most common one that you read in the literature. Most translations obscure God's name by changing Yahweh to the Lord some 6,828 times in the Old Testament. That's like once every four verses, they change it. Um, Yahweh relates to the Hebrew word for being. Now, you'd have to go to the previous verse to see that. Moses says, what do I say to the Israelites? And he says, Ehiyah asher ehiyah, which means um, I will be what I will be, or I am that I am. There are different translations of it. It's this word being is at the heart of the word Yahweh existence. Thus, Yahweh is the one who was, who is, and who is to come, the existing one. That's what the name means. It means the one who is or the one who causes to be. There's some debate which, which way to take it. 
And this is another term I want to introduce. Yahweh is ase. That's a Latin phrase, which means from himself. It means that he's existing independently of everything else. He is not contingent, derived, or dependent. That's what ase means. Ase means, I, I'm not ase. I came from my parents. Besides, if, my parent, if that weren't even true, I can't live without air. I can't live without eating. I mean, maybe a little while, right? A few hours, a few days, right? But then I would die. I'm not ase. I'm not from myself. I can't just exist. I don't have the property of aseity. God does. And thank God that God has aseity and that doesn't, he doesn't depend on, like Santa Claus, everyone's good wishes or something like that. You know, like he just exists, whether you're a good boy or a bad boy, whether you're a good girl or a bad girl, whether everyone believes in him or nobody believes in him, whether there's a universe or it's before the time when the universe came into existence, Yahweh is. And I think that's awesome for the record. But my opinion is not what we're talking about here. This is what he reveals about himself. All right, back to this verse, Exodus 3.15. I want you to notice, first of all, he says, tell the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. But then also, notice the pronouns. I want you to notice the pronouns. The pronouns that God uses for himself are my and I. This is my name for all time, and thus I am to be invoked for all generations to come. God chooses to use the pronouns I instead of we and our. These are called singular pronouns. Singular pronouns, this is my big point. Singular pronouns refer to a singular person. So let's talk about some common sense. If God refers to himself using singular personal pronouns, then he is a singular person. For example, Isaiah 45.5, I am Yahweh and there is no other, there is no other God except me. So the pronouns there are I and me, both singular. If others refer to God using singular personal pronouns, then he's a singular person. Rest in God alone, Psalm 62.5 says, my soul, he is the source of my hope. Now this psalmist is referring to God as a he instead of a they, singular pronoun. And third of all, if others address God using singular personal pronouns, then he is a singular person. That is why you are great, Lord Yahweh. There is no one like you, God, but you alone. 2 Samuel 7.22 Now in English, we tend, at least in this part of the country, to use the word you for a singular and for a plural. But Hebrew is different. Hebrew has a singular form and it has a plural form. Actually, it's more complicated than that. It has extra stuff too, feminine and masculine forms too. But (laughs) my point is simply that these are singular forms, not plural forms of you. Okay, so as soon as I suggest that God is a singular person and that God uses singular personal pronouns like I and me, some may ask the question, yes, Pastor Sean, I hear what you're saying, but doesn't God say us sometimes? Doesn't he say, let us make man? Genesis 126. Yes, you're right, he does. Genesis 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. See that? Those are plural pronouns. No, quite, I'm not going to argue that. That's true. Okay, no sense in arguing against something that's obviously a fact. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps of on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his image, his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. This is a conundrum for everyone. In verse 26, God uses plural pronouns. In verse 27, God uses singular pronouns. Well, these are singular pronouns used by the narrator narrator of God, but that's not a distinction that matters. So we have plural and then we have singular. There it is, plurality and unity. It's got to be the Trinity, right? There are actually four times that God says us in the Bible. Did you know that? There are four us texts in the whole Bible, Genesis 1, 26, 3, 22, 11, 7, and Isaiah 6, 8. Let's read them. 
Genesis 1.26, we already read, right? Let us make man in our image. Genesis 3.22, this is after the fall. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Genesis 11.7, this is the Tower of Babel. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language. Isaiah 6.8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So these are the four us texts, the four times God says us in the Bible. And I thought Michael Heiser offered a really good explanation for this. Now, full disclosure, Michael Heiser is a scholar for Logos, the Bible software, and he does believe in the Trinity. So it's not like he's going to hide this if, he, if it is true. And this is what he says in his book, The Unseen Realm. Many, and he's not an outlier, okay? I'm not picking a weirdo. I mean, he is weird in some ways, but not in this way, not in light of his uh, theology. Many Bible readers know the plural pronouns, us, our, with curiosity. They might suggest that the plurals refer to the Trinity. But technical research in Hebrew grammar and exegesis has shown that the Trinity is not a a coherent explanation. He continues in the footnote. The solution is much more straightforward, one that an ancient Israelite would have readily discerned. What we have is a single person, God, addressing a group, the members of his divine council. You see that? We have a single person addressing a group. You know what? That's just like you. If I say, let us finish up this class and go eat some snacks, I'm a single person addressing a group. That's how we use us. That's just what the word us does. Heiser goes on. It's like me going into a room of friends and saying, hey, let's go get some pizza. I'm the one speaking. A group is hearing what I say. Similarly, God comes to the divine council with an exciting announcement. Let's create humankind. But if God is speaking to his divine council here, does that suggest that humankind was created by more than one Elohim? Was the creation of humankind a group project? That would be hysterical, right? You have like all the different spiritual beings and they're all like, well, I think they should have curly hair. And the other one's like, I think they have, should have straight hair. And I think they should have two legs. The other one's like, I think they should have four legs. You know, and that would be hysterical, right? That's not what he's suggesting. He says, not at all. It's not a group project. Back to my pizza illustration. If I am the one paying for the pizza making the plan happen after announcing it, then I retain both the inspiration and the initiative for the entire project. That's how Genesis 126 works. Genesis 127 tells us clearly that only God himself does the creating. In the Hebrew, all the verbs of creation in the passage are singular in form. So God created humankind in his image. In the likeness of God, he created him. The other members of the council do not participate in the creation of humankind. They watch, just as they did when God laid the foundations of the earth in Job 38, 7. All right, so let's review. Let's review. We're drawing to a close here. We've been looking at the topic, Yahweh, the supreme creator. What have we seen so far? One, the God of the Bible is the supreme creator of our ordered world. Two, He is utterly unrivaled in his role as God over all. His name is Yahweh, which implies that he is the existing one, the one who always is. Thousands of times, the Bible employs singular pronouns for God, which strongly implies he is a singular person. Four times, God says us, which likely resulted from him talking to other members of his divine counsel. So next time, we're going to talk about the Shema. And that is the core creed of Israel in our efforts to understand our one God who's over all.